Hi everyone. Uh, myself, Dr. Shivraman, uh, mentor and faculty of medicine, ADR Plexus. So very happy to meet you today uh, in this session of uh, post-exam discussion. So it's actually a tough thing uh, to discuss uh, uh, questions or the related uh, uh, topics after an exam because actually the exam uh, stem uh, question stem which is being asked in the exam if has a small variation in its grammar and word then the answer is going to be totally a different thing but the substance of the topics which are asked in the exam is going to give you a, a broader view about what kind of question was asked uh, in the exam and how it is going to help your juniors or help others in near future. So this discussion session is aimed at how the topics are dealt by the exam conducting body and how the subject has to be uh, learned or uh, studied uh, in whatever source of material you have. So this discussion is mainly going to be on topics related to the uh, recent NEET PG exam okay and uh, there is uh, uh, no exact variant of the question uh, will be represented here so for this session is going to be uh, helpful to you in learning uh, medicine in a much better way so with this uh, uh, i also congratulate all of you who are going to be uh, toppers in the upcoming uh, neat exam exam results in uh, in a couple of weeks so with us uh, i'll go into the uh, subject so a uh, question was asked in your exam a uh, type of uh, topic where uh, which of the following is used in abortive therapy in patient with migraine headache so the question was which of the following is used in abortive therapy that is when a patient comes to you with an acute headache which is uh, having symptoms uh, correlating with migraine, what is the acute treatment you are going to give? So the options were topiramate, valproate, sumatriptan, and fluorazine. So if you consider the answer for this question, it is going to be sumatriptan. Okay. So sumatriptan is used as an abortive therapy in migraine headache. And this we have discussed in our routine class where whenever a patient comes with a migraine-like headache and it is going to be of moderate intensity, we are going to try triptans, which are going to be 5-HT1-BD agonist. So this we have already discussed in our uh, class. And in this class of drugs, we are going to have our sumatriptan. And it can be given as an oral treatment or it can be given as a parenteral treatment. Right? And drugs which are used in prophylaxis, we can see here we have amitriptyline, beta blockers, flunorazine, valproate, topiramate, methysergide. So these are the drugs which are used in prophylaxis of migraine. So coming back to your question, topiramate, valproate, flunorazine are used in prophylaxis, rather sumatriptan is used in treatment of acute migraine headache. So this is the first related topic and I hope you are clear with the answer. Then the second question was, a patient was diagnosed with severe Alzheimer's disease and he was prescribed a medicine that acts against NMDA receptors in the brain. Which of the following drug belongs to uh, class uh, or which of the following drug belong to this group of drug class? So here the options were Donipizil, Memantin, Galantamine, and pyracetam. These were the options given in the exam. And if you consider these options, uh, the question being asked, which drug targets NMDA receptor? So you people very well know that we have discussed this question in our routine class where the treatment of uh, patients with the Alzheimer's disease is going to be anticholinesterase, NMDA antagonist, and beta gamma secretase inhibitor. And in anticholinesterase, we have donipizil, rivastigmine, tacrine, and galantamine. And an NMDA antagonist, which is going to be the memory increasing drug, memantine. 
So hope you are clear with that uh, answer, right? So this is the answer here is going to be memantine, which is going to be acting on the NMDA receptor as an antagonist. Okay, so the next question is an antiemetic drug was used by a patient for vomiting who was on chemotherapy for his carcinoma and then he developed extra pyramidal symptoms and dystonic features. Which of the following drug would have caused this? So whatever options we have got were scopolamine, ondansetron, metaclopramide. So if you consider the drug which is going to cause extra pyramidal symptoms or dystonic features or it is going to cause some kind of movement disorder, then it is going to be a drug which is going to cause secondary Parkinsonism, right? So what is the drug which is going to cause secondary Parkinsonism? If you take our class uh, discussion, we know the drugs which are going to be causing secondary Parkinsonism are classified as moral drugs where we had methyl, uh, metaclopramide, methyl dopa, olanacipin, risperidone, aripiprazole, lithium. And if you consider the answer for this question, it is going to be metaclopramide. This we have discussed already in our uh, class. In your, you would have been written very well because you would have uh, had this in your notes also. Okay, so going to the next question, which of the following drug is preferred in a patient presenting with spasms, okay, and keeps arrhythmia? So it is a child or an infant of an age group of three to uh, less than one year is presenting to you with spasm and hips arrhythmia. What is the drug preferred? So the options were ACTH, valproate, phenytoin, and felbamate. So what should be the answer here? This is a very, uh, very, very uh, uh, easy question to answer. Yes, the answer is going to be ACTH. So if you take our neurology discussion, so this infantile spasm is also called as epileptiform spasm, where usually it is going to affect boys of age group three months to seven months, but usually uh, infant is getting affected with a prior history of birth ischemia. Now this EEG is going to show hip arrhythmia. Okay, the chaotic EEG waves, where the patient is going to have uh, uh, salam spells or jackknife spells. Okay, and uh, what is the treatment of choice here? It is going to be ACTH. And whenever it is associated with the tuberous sclerosis, we give Vega Batrin. So, yes, as you said, the answer is going to be ACTH. Right? So, this is about the treatment of infantile spasm or West syndrome or epileptic force spasm. It is very well, we have discussed this uh, in our uh, regular sessions. Okay. Now, a patient comes to you with uh, photophobia, lacrimation, and retroorbital headache, which nerve supply is affected. So, this question is an integrated question where they have integrated clinical medicine with anatomy. And this, you people know very well. So whenever a patient comes with the photophobia, lacrimation, retroorbital headache, along with sometimes the patient has flushing or patient has rhinorrhea-like symptoms, as we discussed in our uh, sessions, whenever a patient has pain along the distribution of the fifth cranial nerve, okay, then this patient is going to have a group of disorders uh, called PAC disorders called as trigeminal autonomic cephalgias. And in trigeminal autonomic cephalgias, we have three diseases. The first one is called cluster headache. The second one is going to be paroxysmal hemicrania. And the third one is going to be sunk of soma. So any patient having these kind of symptoms, okay? So it is going to be uh, involving the fifth cranial nerve. So answer to this question is going to be trigeminal nerve, right? Trigeminal nerve. So, I think I'm very clear with that uh, answer. So this we have already discussed in our regular class after that it is going to be along the distribution of fifth cranial now. Okay, so uh, I hope I'm clear with the, uh, uh, the, the topic and the discussion. Okay, so we will go to the next question. A young patient presents with eye pain, bilateral swelling in the face, and the patient was done uh, or subjected to a chest X-ray where it showed bilateral hilar adenopathy. What is the most likely diagnosis? The options are tuberculosis, lymphoma, sarcoidosis, hypersensitive pneumonitis. 
okay so hypersensitive hypersensitive pneumonitis will have cheese state appearance in the ct scan and there is should be a history of exposure it is not there and lymphoma the patient should have uh, other symptoms which are b symptoms should be can be given or some symptoms like weight loss or loss of appetite and uh, any other features uh, 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 specific organ involvement is not there and tuberculosis the patient will not uh, usually present with uh, bilateral swelling in the face okay and there is going to be no bilateral hilar adenopathy so here the left over option is sarcoidosis and we have very well seen this topic in our regular discussion and during our 6 am discussion also that it is associated with the syndrome called keir ford syndrome which is characterized by parotid enlargement that is a bilateral swelling in the face and uh, uveit which is going to be the uh, reason for the eye pain and the patient has fever and facial weakness so this is called a keir ford syndrome and if you take the staging of uh, uh, sarcoidosis we have a staging called scadding staging where stage a is bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy and stage 2 is bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy with uh, uh, infiltration and stage 3 is infiltration alone and stage 4 is fibrosis so this is clearly fits into our diagnosis where patient has eye pain bilateral swelling in the face and chest x ray bilateral hilar adenopathy so the answer is going to be sarcoidosis okay so this is a very uh, a good question where we have to correlate two three uh, related things the same topic to get the diagnosis right so we'll go into the next question a diabetic patient post covid after a few months developed hemicranial pain with loosening of teeth okay loosening of teeth what investigation will be done on priority basis to confirm the diagnosis so they have asked what investigation will be done on priority basis to confirm the diagnosis okay head mri mucor nasal swab ct scan okay these are options we we try to get i mean uh, we had and uh, what should be the answer here so if you recollect from our uh, covid session which we had a covid marathon session where we discussed about mucormycosis and in that session i have told that it is also called as rhino orbital cerebral mucormycosis where the patient is going to have a facial numbness or pain or congestion and nasal discharge toothache will be there we have discussed there toothache will be there and uh, blurring of vision can be there diplopia can be there and orbital pain can be there okay and this patient what is the gold standard investigation which is going to confirm the diagnosis it is going to be a nasal swab with the biopsy which is going to show the ribbon like aseptated hyphal elements which are present at right angles okay right angles so it is going to be strained by pass hematoxylin eosin staining and you are going to get the branched uh, fungi okay branched fungi which is going to tell this is going due to mucormycosis okay mucormycosis so this answer here is going to be mucor nasal swab is done to confirm the diagnosis that is a very very key word here to confirm the diagnosis okay even though mri can give you an idea that there is some kind of uh, opacification in the sinus and it is going to be likely to be a mucor mycosis but the confirmation is given by nasal swab and biopsy so this is very very important point to note here okay so this is about mucor mycosis and this uh, session had a lot of covid related questions so integration of covid with the general uh, uh, medicine is very very important in upcoming years also okay in upcoming years also okay so which are the following drug has least side effect on pleura okay the options were metformin bromocriptin methicillin okay methicillin nitrofurantoin so these were the options and you people if you are able to recollect from our pleural effusion chapter discussion we discussed that what are the drugs which causes uh plural involvement okay plural involvement okay it is going to be dantrolene nitrofurantoin bromocriptin dasatinib amiodarone methicillin and methotrexate these were the drugs which are going to cause drug induced pleural effusion drug induced fibrosis etc 
and uh, if you see the options here, nitrofurantoin is ruled out, methicillin is ruled out, and bromocryptin is ruled out. So the option is going to be metformin. Okay, so this has the least, least side effect over pleura. Okay, so this is a very very important thing to note here. So this is where we have uh, scored very well, and we have discussed about the drug induced pleural involvement in our routine uh, discussion. Okay, routine discussion. Okay, so the next question is a 27 year old male patient with RTA was admitted in hospital. After two days of admission, he developed dyspnea, petechial rashes, and altered sensorium. Okay, so whenever a patient in a ward after a surgery or a trauma or any kind of a prolonged procedure, if he develops dyspnea, which is acute in onset, then we have to think about pulmonary embolism. Right, pulmonary embolism, which is thromboembolism. Okay, but whenever in our regular class, I have told you that whenever they give the word called petechiae with altered sensorium, petechiae with altered sensorium, then straight away you can mark your answer as fat embolism. Okay, fat embolism. Okay, so that is very, 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 very important. Okay. Fat embolism. So fat embolism is very, very important thing which can be correlated from the symptoms which is given here, which is going to be petechiae and mental status changes. Okay, so please remember this and this is, comes under a criteria called GERD's criteria and what is the treatment you are going to give? Hyperbaric oxygen. Okay, hyperbaric oxygen. So this is very well discussed in our uh, regular class. If you are uh, able to remember, recollect it, it is very good that you will have scored uh, four marks very easily. Okay, so this is about the GERD's criteria in fat embolism. I will go into the next question. A young patient brought to emergency department after RTA. He had bruises on chest. His pulse was 120 per minute and had a blood pressure of 90 by 60 and was tachypneic. His chest x-ray is shown below what is the most appropriate step to be done in managing this patient. So actually the image which uh, uh, was given was like this, where the new, uh, uh, where the uh, vasculature markings is present like this, but here it was absent on the left side. So whenever the X-ray is given like this, then it indicates it is a case of pneumothorax. So very well, whenever the pneumothorax patient comes to you, so we have discussed already whenever a patient has an hypotension trachea shift with absent breath sounds. The first thing is you will go for A, B, C and give 100% oxygen and keep the patient in upright position. As an immediate treatment, you go for a thoraco uh, uh, synthesis in the form of you go, you just put a needle over the second intercostal space and now they say that according to the latest guidelines, it is the fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line and followed by you have to go for chest tube drainage. Okay, so the answer here is chest tube and drainage putting, I mean, putting a chest tube and going for drainage is the immediate wise step to be done in this patient. So this we have already discussed very well in our discussion. Okay, very well in our discussion. Okay, so this is about the uh, question on pneumothorax and how whether to go for chest tube drainage or not. Okay, the next question. There was a question uh, related like this. Uh, all of the following conditions uh, or which of the following condition is having autosomal recessive inheritance, okay? Even though the multiple options were given, the option which was strikingly going to help you in making the uh, diagnosis was cystic fibrosis. Okay, the odd one out in that uh, question was cystic fibrosis because cystic fibrosis is a condition where there is going to be a problem in the CFTR channel and this CFTR channel problem is because of uh, autosomal recessive inheritance uh, which is going to cause mutation at the level of chromosome 7 at the delta 508. So even though there are multiple uh, uh, mutations are there, the most common mutation is going to be delta 508 mutation and cystic fibrosis is autosomal recessive inheritance. Okay, so this is about the cystic fibrosis. Next question is, which of the following defines MDR-TB? So the option 
options were given, but the option which was appropriate in this question was resistant to rifampicin and isoniazid. So if you take our uh, uh, tuberculosis discussion chapter, we discussed what is drug resistant TB. So the first one is monodrug resistance. Okay, monodrug resistance. Okay, the monodrug resistant is you are resistant to one drug other than HNR. Okay, polydrug resistance. You are resistant to two drugs other than HNR. Okay, and MDR TB where you are resistant to HNR. And there is a terminology called pre XDR TB where the patient is resistant to HR plus fluoroquinolone, and XDR TB is resistant to HR fluoroquinolones and one second line injectable drug that is called as XDR TB. So, our answer fits very well into this MDR TB. Okay, our answer fits very well into that MDR TB. Okay, so this is about the drug resistant TB which was asked in the recent exam. Okay, the next question is a patient with nasal polyposis and asthma like feature present to you, which of the following drugs should be avoided in this patient? The drugs avoided can be comamaxiclav, cotramoxone, aspirin. But what is the correct answer here? So if you able to recollect our bronchial asthma discussion, we discussed something called Samtus triad, which is characterized by nasal polyposis, intrinsic asthma, and aspirin sensitivity. So whenever a patient who is genetically uh, determined, in that case, if the patient is going to be exposed to aspirin, he is going to have intrinsic asthma-like feature. Okay, intrinsic asthma-like symptoms going to develop, and the answer here is going to be aspirin. Okay, then the next question, a 40-year-old female patient presented with history of oral ulcers, arthritis and rashes. On routine examination, the RBC was found in urine, which are the following the most likely diagnosis. Okay, so we will try to rule out the options. Cystitis, where there is an inflammation of the bladder and the patient is going to have WBC in urine, can have WBC in urine, and there is no reason for oral ulcers and arthritis. Then PSGN. PSGN usually is post-retrovocal glomerulonephritis and usually followed by a, a skin infection. The patient is going to have uh, kidney involvement. And again, here the oral ulcers and arthritis are against the diagnosis, even though RBC cast can be seen in the urine. Next is acute interstitial nephritis, where the patient is going to have some kind of uh, uh, exposure, which is going to cause interstitial nephritis. And these patients can have rashes, eosinophilia. But RBC is most unlikely found in these cases. Now, we have left over one option, lupus nephritis. And now you can ask me why it is lupus nephritis. Okay, if you have remember, if you remember our uh, ACR ULR criteria, you see the patient has arthritis, skin involvement, along with the renal domain involvement. Okay, where the patient is going to have uh, lupus nephritis in the with the uh, histopathological changes, and the patient is going to have microscopic hematuria. Microscopic hematuria. For this microscopic hematuria, you will plan for a biopsy. So all these clinical features, the mouth ulcers, the arthritis, and uh, your rashes. Okay, all fits into the diagnosis of lupus nephritis. Okay, lupus nephritis, and we have seen our uh, patients' uh, discussion. 50 to 60 percent cases of lupus will have nephritis. Okay, we'll have nephritis, and this is again the direct uh, takeaway point from the our notes. Okay, from our notes. Okay, so this emphasizes the importance of revision of notes which we have uh, made all through this. Uh, year in different sessions, okay? Then, and how to correlate the questions clinically, which we used to do regularly in our sessions, okay? Which we used to try a lot of clinical questions. So, so, that correlation is very, very important. Okay, next is, a patient with rheumatoid arthritis on ophthalmological examination is found to have following feature. What could be the diagnosis? The options were sclerosis perforans, staphyloma, and episcleritis. So if you recollect our rheumatology session, I have clearly told that in extra articular manifestation of rheumatoid arthritis, 
the i involvement is very important in that scleritis is the most characteristic feature in rheumatoid arthritis but episcleritis will again be present in rheumatoid arthritis and in episcleritis because of the thinning there is going to be scleromalacia perforans which will be seen like this this is called scleromalacia perforans right hope i am clear with this this i have shown you the picture also i have explained this also in our routine uh, discussions okay routine discussions okay next question is very good question or very commonly uh, uh, used uh, thing in our practice which are the following regimen is preferred with benzodiazepine penicillin secondary to prophylaxis of patient with arf without carditis the options were you give the prophylaxis which is going to be secondary prophylaxis with benzodiazepine penicillin three times a week some give two times a week also but it is uh, usually three times a week and how long you have to give five years after last attack or 21 years of age five years after last attack or 18 years of age for 10 years after the last attack or 40 years of age and lifelong okay so you are going to divide our patients like this so if you take the uh, our uh, routine uh, discussion where we did it in our triple r session also we did it in our regular urology session also whenever a patient has a, a staphylococcus pharyngitis and within 9 days you have to start antibiotics to prevent acute rheumatic fever and this is called as primary prophylaxis so what is secondary prophylaxis any patient with arf without carditis okay, without involvement of heart you have to give secondary prophylaxis 5 years or 20 or 21 years of age whichever is longer whenever a patient has arf with carditis then you have to give treatment for 10 years or 21 years of age whichever is longer it is 10 years from the uh, onset of uh, uh, carditis and whenever a patient has ar with rheumatic heart disease where there is an uh, valve involvement and disability is present then you have to give 10 years or 40 years of age or lifelong in in countries like india okay lifelong in countries like india okay so here the doubt here is few books says that 5 years after last attack or 18 years of age many used to ask me this is according to actually who but what american heart association recommends is whenever a patient has rheumatic fever without carditis you have to give 5 years from the onset of illness or till 21 years of age whichever is longer Then the next tip is thing i want to discuss here is a 65 year old male patient presenting with rigidity tremor bradykinesia and mast faces which are the following agent will be given the options were donepezil selegilin thiorodazine and haloperidol and the answer here is going to be selegilin why selegilin is important is selegilin is one drug which is going to be a mavob inhibitor okay mavob inhibitor and it is helping in pro prevention of progression of disease in patients with uh, parkinsons and it is going to act as a neuroprotective and this we have already discussed selegilin okay and one more thing here i want to emphasize is uh, the selegilin and rasegilin are apart from being neuroprotective and uh, it is going to prevent the disease progression the pathology is slow down okay slow down which is not seen in other patients other group of drugs and one more important thing about this uh, mavob inhibitors is it is whenever mavob is come uh, uh, given together with the patient in dopa then what is going to happen the dopa dose requirement decreases and you can also prevent uh, this synergia okay and you can also prevent on off phenomenon okay on off phenomenon so this is very very important thing okay a patient post thyroid surgery develops perioral numbness which is due to okay so a patient went for thyroid surgery and after thyroid surgery coming out of the theater the patient develops perioral or sarcomoral uh, numbness okay so if you consider the answer for this question so in thyroidectomy patient after thyroidectomy what is going to happen the patient is going to have decrease in serum calcium of more than 8.5 mg per dl due to hypoparathyroidism okay hypoparathyroidism and uh, hypoparathyroidism is going to cause hypocalcemia hypocalcemia okay hypoparathyroidism 
is going to cause hypocalcemia. Okay, and whenever a patient develops hypocalcemia, just we have discussed in our sessions also, the patient is going to develop perioral paresthesias. Okay, paresthesias and anesthesias. So the answer is going to be hypocalcemia due to low PTH. Okay, hypocalcemia due to low PTH. Coming to next question, which of the following is not seen in men to be? The options were mucosal neuromas, parathyroid adenoma, megacolon, and morphanoid habitus. Okay, so these were the options. So if you try to rule out the options, see, whenever a patient has men 2B or men 3, which is also called as Wegman thrombos syndrome, which is due to involvement of red oncogene chromosome number 10. Okay, and uh, this is condition is characterized by MTC with few chromocytoma. So what is the role of pituitary adenoma here? There is no role of pituitary adenoma. Pituitary adenoma is ruled out. Okay. Then coming to the next thing, next thing, uh, the patient can have mucosal neuromas. The patient can have megacolon. The patient can have uh, 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 lens dislocation. Okay, lens dislocation, and uh, the patient can also have morphonoid features. Okay, morphonoid evidence or morphonoid features, and the patient is going to have. Uh, uh, medulated corneal. So you can see the thickening over the sclera and it is going to be a medulated corneal now. So considering this, considering this, the answer is going to be parathyroid adenoma. Parathyroid adenoma. So because of neuromas, megacolon, morphine epitus, everything is seen in men 2B or 3. So the odd man out here is going to be parathyroid adenoma. Okay, the following picture is associated with metabolic syndrome, hyperparathyroidism, hypothyroidism, and Addison's disease. Okay, so this is the option given here. And when you see this picture, a lot of times the striking appearance is going to be acanthosis migrans. So acanthosis migrans is associated with uh, excess insulin and insulin resistance state. Okay, insulin resistance state where there is going to be activation, preferential activation of fibroblasts, and this fibroblast is going to cause changes in the skin. This is called as uh, acanthosis migrans. Uh, this acanthosis migrans is associated with metabolic syndrome, which is characterized by insulin resistance, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. Okay, or hyperlipidemia. So this is metabolic syndrome. Okay, and it is associated with uh, metabolic syndrome, and we have discussed this also in our regular sessions. Okay, a patient with widening of tooth and frontal thickening and enlarged bone, which are the following drugs acts on GH receptor as an antagonist. The options were pegvisomen, octreotide, glucrolide, and bromocryptin. So, what should be the answer? You people can say me. The answer is yes, pegvisomen. Okay, pegvisomen. So whenever, I, I told you in endocrinology, whenever in the patient with growth hormone excess, whenever it is due to an adenoma, the first line of treatment is going to be surgical excision, which is going to be the treatment which has to be tried in these patients. And whenever there is a case is not responding to surgery, or whenever the past history of uh, uh, GH level and IGF level is known, then you have to go for a drug which is going to act on the somatostatin receptor as an analog, and it is going to be octreotide, Landriotide and Pasriotide. And if it is failing and this case is severe resistant, then you can go for Pegbisomant. This Pegbisomant is going to act on the uh, insulin like growth factor receptor and it is going to inhibit uh, the transcriptional changes. So Pegbisomant is going to act on the GH receptor, thereby GH receptor is not activated. Okay, GH receptor is not activated. Okay, and thereby it is going to decrease the IGF level. But since the growth hormone is not uh, activating the receptor, our body will think that the growth hormone level is low and it is going to go into the pituitary gland to stimulate release of more growth hormone. And this is due to involvement or usage of a drug which is going to be a GHR antagonist. Okay, GHR antagonist. So this is about the question. I hope you have done very well because we have discussed this in our endocrine class. Okay, the next question is which of the following treatment is preferred in a female patient? With abdomen pain, vomiting, with blood sugar of more than 500, with acidosis and urine ketones positive. Okay, so coming to this question, any patient uh, with uh, decay is coming to you, you try to identify the cause. The first thing what you're going to do is you're going to go for IV fluids. Okay, and concomitantly together, you can also start an insulin, which is going to be a regular insulin more than a short acting insulin. And whenever you are going to 
start insulin, always check for potassium level. If the potassium level is less than 3.3 millimolar per deciliter, then correct potassium and then followed by you start on insulin. So answer here is you go for IV fluid with insulin. IV fluid with insulin. Next, acromegaly patient surgical removal was not complete response. What drug to be given now? So a patient who went for acromegaly treatment, whenever you told you acromegaly treatment, the first treatment is going to be surgery. Second is going to be somatostatin receptor. Third question is going to be third point is going to be growth hormone receptor antagonist. So whenever surgery fails, then you go for SSR, and one of the SSR is going to be octreotide. Okay, if octreotide fails, then you can go for growth hormone receptor antagonist. Okay, this is very very important. Acromegaly patient. Acromegaly patient, surgical removal was not done and there was no complete response. So you have to go for octreotide. And this we have discussed. In the assisted cases, post-surgery level, if the GH level and IGF level is not falling down, then you can go for octreotide. With octreotide patient is not responding, then you can go for GH receptor antibody. It's going to be pink viso man. Okay, pink viso man. Okay, so this is about the question. So hope the discussion is clear. The next thing is a female patient with galactoria, the urine pregnancy test was negative. MRI of Kate revealed a large pregnant tumor. Patient refused to undergo surgery for the tumor and want to conceive in near future. Which of the following is the best drug for treatment of this patient? The options are octreotide, bromocryptin, and cabotidin. Okay, so if the patient comes to you with galactoria, milk secretion with a large pregnant tumor, and she doesn't want to go for surgery. So this prolactinoma, we have discussed in our protein class. We have discussed in our routine class. Whenever the prolactinoma patient is coming to you, the patient is going to have a prolactin level of more than 200 if it is a microadenoma and more than 400 if it is a macroadenoma. Okay, and if the patient is willing for pregnancy in near future, then you go for bromocryptin than cabergoldin. Cabergoldin. Okay, cabergoldin. And you have to be very careful with the bromocryptin because you have to screen the patient for with the 2D effort to prevent the valvular fibrosis. Okay, valvular fibrosis. So the answer is bromocryptin. Which of the following is indicated in this picture? Okay. So there are two, two uh, uh, things where the there is release into the nearby area, okay, or the interstitium, and from here it is going to go and communicate with the next cell. Okay. So what is this picture indicates? So if you remember in our endocrinology session in the first session itself we have discussed right the chemical signaling can be an autocrine where a cell communicates with its own okay communicates with its own the next is signaling gap junction signaling gap junction is where the cells are going to get connected through channels and they are going to exchange information and the third one is going to be paracrine where it gets dissolved in the nearby area and there the next cell picks up it and the information passes on, passes on, passes on. Whereas endocrine is a condition where it is released into the circulation and it goes to the distant organ and here the answer is going to be the paracrine. Paracrine. Okay, paracrine where it is released into the surrounding area and it is uh, recognized by the next cell. The next question was, a seven-year-old male child presented with palpable purpura over limbs and buttock and complained of abdomen pain, arthralgia and previous history of URTA. What is the treatment for this condition? So this patient is coming to you with uh, these kind of complaints. So what should be your diagnosis? What is your mind is telling when you see this kind of question? So I told you in our exam, whenever lower limb palpable purpura is given, then it is going to be a vasculitis, which is going to be a small vessel vasculitis, which is going to be Henox Conlin purpura, and there is going to be a history of U or TA also. Okay, Henox Conlin purpura, uh, where there is a small vessel vasculitis, and it is due to deposition of IgA. Okay, it is usually followed by a URI, and the patient will have predominantly lower limb rashes. Okay, lower limb rashes, which is going to be non blanching, palpable, non thrombocytopenic purpura. And these patients, the treatment of choice was asked, and the treatment of choice is going to be steroids. Okay, steroids are the treatment of choice in these patients. Okay, steroids are the treatment of choice in this patient, and very well we have.
discuss this topic in our uh, rheumatology discussion also. And the next question, a DBT patient was started on anticoagulant therapy and the next day the patient presented with features in the diagram shown below. So when you see this picture, what is your mind telling? There is some kind of discoloration and if you see closely, there is going to be small, small vessels, cutaneous vessels which are going for both thrombosis. So whenever I discuss warfare, I usually I used to tell this point and this class also I told you so you have been, you've been able to recollect this point very easily. Whenever a patient was put on warfarin for any reason without any overlap of LFDPH, what is going to happen is this warfarin is going to inhibit carboxylation of cofactor uh, number 297910 uh, and it is also going to inhibit protein C and protein S. Okay, so protein C and S have a lesser half life than factor uh, 7. So, what is going to happen initially? What is going to happen is the factors which are going to prevent coagulation are going to decrease. Okay, so this is going to cause uh, thrombosis of the small vessel and it is going to cause purple toe syndrome. And uh, over the skull and over the skin, it is also going to cause superficial necrosis of warfarin. Okay, necrosis of warfarin. And this is a very, very important point which has to be emphasized uh, whenever we have a discussion on warfarin. Okay, so. With this, uh, I am finishing our discussion. So I have handpicked 27 related topics and those topics, the exact uh, discussion were done in our regular session. So hope you people have revised for this exam very well and you people would have cracked this 27 questions, whatever we have discussed without any trouble. And there might be few questions which we, the related topics which have been discussed in the exam, and I would have not got the exact stem or the key for that uh, question. If you find out anything like that, you can please let me know. Very well, we will discuss it. Okay, so that is useful for you whenever you apply for uh, or your friends apply for the next uh, initiate exam also. But hopefully, my prayers are with you people and you people who have attended our uh, uh, NEAT exam this year are going to come out with flying colors and you guys, you have next one month with you. So enjoy this period. This is a wonderful period to have your mind in relaxation because days are going to come when you'll be busy with your uh, counseling, joining, first year at PG, etc. So this period is a wonderful period. Enjoy the session, enjoy the day, enjoy the atmosphere, okay? And see you soon, all of you as PGs, as lovable PGs. Have a nice day, good luck and best wishes. Thank you.